shrink, ka e i la ring, asa ka la ring, sa ka la ring, sa wain kling ring shrink. Namaste. <laughs> so we're just sitting here being silly <laughs> and um, getting ready to read the next installment of Maha Nirvana Tantra. And so far, Parvati is still leading up to her big question. And she's been talking about the Krita Yuga, Satya Yuga, and how in that time that all human beings were virtuous, godly, self-realized, self-controlled, sinless, and so on. So now she starts talking about the fall of the Dharma and how it degraded over the next couple of yugas. After the Krita age had passed away, thou didst in the Treta age perceived dharma to be in disorder, and that men were no longer able to accomplish their desires by the Vedic rites. For men, through their anxiety and perplexity, were unable to perform these rites, in which much trouble had to be overcome, and for which much preparation had to be made. In constant distress of mind, they were neither able to perform nor yet were willing to abandon the rites. So if you look in the Vedas, the original four Vedas, there are elaborate instructions for the performance of the Vedic rites. And really they could only be performed by a king with a staff of brahmanas, priests, who had memorized the Vedic literatures. In those days there were no need for books the Vedas were passed on by memory, by speaking and hearing. And the memory training was like hard for us to imagine. But it was so complete that someone could hear an entire day's lesson and memorize it perfectly. Um, there was a case in British India, late 1800s, 19th century, where there had been a murder committed by uh, two British, one against the other. And of course, before the murder, there was an argument. Uh, so in the next room, there had been a servant who had this Brahminical training. And he was actually more advanced, I think, than the murderers. <laughs> but anyway, he heard the conversation, but he didn't speak a word of English. Huh? So at the trial, the judge asked for his testimony, and he repeated the conversation two men had had just before the murder in English without understanding it at all. How is that? because the Brahminical training works by sound vibration. One can memorize any sequence of sounds. I had a little bit of a glimpse of this when I was in conservatory and we were doing solfege training in which the instructor would sing or play a phrase of music and then we would have to either repeat it or write it down. So. This was the same kind of training where we memorized a sequence of sounds and their interrelations, musical intervals and so on. And uh, so it's possible. It's possible that someone could remember and write down even a conversation years afterwards. And that's how the Vedas were passed down. But as the Yugas progressed, it became less and less possible for people to do this. So the, for the Vedas were written down. And of course, as soon as they were written down, there were deviant copies and different recensions of the scriptures and so on like that. So everything became confused. It was very difficult. I mean, you, these rites, you have no idea. They had to build a pavilion out of a certain kind of stone and it had to have particular measurements and the architecture had to be just so. 
And then they had to have like so many cows, calves, bulls, horses, elephants, all kinds of animals, you know, for the sacrifice. And they had to invite so many thousands of people and so many hundreds of brahmanas and feed everybody. And then the fire pit itself was like enormous, like 20 feet square, huge fires. And they would uh, put the sacrificial wood in by means of uh, these instruments called a shruk. A shruk is like a long tongs. They would take the wood and put it on the fire. And then there's a shruva. I have a small shruva. You've seen it in the Siddha Lakshmi Stotram videos. And I use the shruva to ladle the ghee and the sacred fire. So in this way, the sacrifice would go on for days sometimes. And there were so many prayers, so many offerings. And the soma rasa would be distributed. The soma rasa is a psychedelic beverage that gives people the ability to see gods and spirits and like that. So the people attending the sacrifice would actually see the gods when they came to take their share of the offerings and so on. Then was the good old days, huh? So she continues, having observed this, thou didst make known on earth the scripture in the form of smriti. Smriti means remembering which explains the meaning of the Vedas, and thus delivered men too feeble for the practice of tapas and the study of the Vedas from sin, which is the cause of all pain, sorrow, and sickness. For men in this terrible ocean of the world, who is there but thee to be their cherisher, protector, savior, their fatherly benefactor, and Lord? Then, in the Dwapara age, when men abandoned the good works prescribed in the Smritis and were deprived of one half of Dharma and were afflicted by ills of mind and body, they were yet again saved by thee through the instructions of the Sangita and other religious lore. Now the sinful Kali age is upon them, when Dharma is destroyed, an age full of evil customs and deceit, Men pursue evil ways. The Vedas have lost their power. The Smritis are forgotten. And many of the Puranas, which contain stories of the past and show the many ways which lead to liberation, will, O oh Lord, be destroyed. So now she's talking about the degradation of the Vedic civilization in the age of Kali. And of course, anyone who uh, comes to India can see this. Even Indians themselves know it, but they're powerless to stop it. Why? This is something that's ordained by God, by higher powers, by the laws of nature, as they have come down to us. So there really isn't anything we can do about it as a society or as, as a human race. But as individuals, we can overcome the influence of Kali by following the instructions that are given in the Maha Nirvana Tantra. Men will become averse to religious rites without restraint, maddened with pride, ever given over to sinful acts, lustful, gluttonous, cruel, heartless, harsh of speech, deceitful, short-lived, poverty-stricken, harassed by sickness and sorrow, ugly, feeble, low, stupid, mean, and addicted to mean habits, companions of the base, thievish, calumnious, malicious, quarrelsome, depraved, cowards, and ever ailing, devoid of all sense of shame and sin and of fear to seduce the wives of others. Vipras or Brahmanas will live like Shudras, and while neglecting their own Sandhya, will yet officiate at the sacrifices of the low. They will be greedy, given over to wicked and sinful acts, liars, insolent, ignorant, deceitful, mere hangers-on of others, the sellers of their daughters, degraded, averse to all tapas and vrata. They will be heretics, impostors, and think themselves wise. 
They will be without faith or devotion and will do japa and puja with no other end than to dupe the people. They will eat unclean food and follow evil customs. They will serve and eat the food of the shudras and lust after low women and will be wicked and ready to barter for money, even their own wives. In short, the only sign that they are brahmanas will be the thread they wear. Observing no rule in eating or drinking or in other matters, scoffing at the Dharma scriptures, no thought of pious speech ever so much as entering their minds. They will be but bent upon the injury of the good. Ooh wee <laughs> She lays it on pretty thick. Hey, but just look at the news every day. Huh? Even the leaders of nations have these qualities. So what to speak of the ordinary people? You know, whatever the leaders of society do and however they comport themselves, then the common men will follow in their example. And certainly they have. By thee also have been composed for the good and liberation of men the tantras, the mass of agamas and nigamas, which bestow both enjoyment and liberation, containing mantras and yantras and rules as to the sadhana of both devis and devas. By thee, too, have been described many forms of nyasa, such as those called shrishti, stiti, and sanghara. By thee, again, have been described the various seated positions of yoga, such as that of the bound and loosened lotus, the pashu, vira, and divya classes of men, as also the devata, who gives success in the use of each of the mantras. And yet again it is thou who hast made known in a thousand ways rites relating to the worship with women, and the rites which are done in the use, sorry, with the use of skulls, a corpse, or when seated on the funeral pyre. By thee too have been forbidden both Pashubhava and Divya Bhava. If in this age the Pashubhava cannot exist, how can there be Divya Bhava? For the Pashu must collect leaves, flowers, fruits, and water with his own hand, and should not look at a Shudra or even think of a woman. So she's talking now about the different Vedic rites that are given in the Tantras. Many of these rites are no longer suitable because human beings do not have the qualifications to perform them. So a Pashu means an animal. Huh? an animalistic human being. So there are different religious practices that are given for the Pashus in, in different geographical and, and cultural environments. And so these rites no longer are applicable and all their rules and regulations and so on no longer work because of the degradation of the age of Kali. It has become so complete and so all-pervading that even the, the rules of the Tantras are superseded by a different process. And then she's going to describe that in the next section. On the other hand, the Divya is all but a Deva, ever pure of heart, and to whom all opposites are alike, free from attachment to worldly things, the same to all creatures, and forgiving. How can men, with the taint of this age upon them, who are ever of restless mind, prone to sleep and sloth, attain to purity of disposition? By thee, too, have been spoken the rites of Virasadana, relating to the Panchatattva, namely, wine, meat, fish, parched grain, and sexual union of man and woman. The Maituna, the Tantra Maituna or the Kama Sutra path. Huh? This sadhana has been given for the age of Kali in the Tantras. Why? Because nobody can practice the, <laughs> nobody can practice the other rules and regulations. Everybody's eating meat and fish and stuff anyway. Huh? 
So by very cleverly making it into a religious ritual, then these activities, although in a previous age they would lead to going to hell, become actually a path for liberation for the lowest of mankind, the Pashu Bhava. The, the Dadivya Bhava, the, the people who are enlightened, don't need any rights. They don't need any rules and regulations because they're harmless. They hold no anger. They, they cast no blame. And their purpose is for the benefit of all living entities. But for those who are not on this platform of purity, some religious rights are needed. So let's take the things that they're going to do anyway and make them into a religious practice. But since the men of the Kali age are full of greed, lust, and gluttony, they will on that account neglect the sadhana and will fall into sin. And having drunk much wine for the sake of the pleasure of the senses, will become mad with intoxication and bereft of all notion of right and wrong. Some will violate the wives of others. Others will become rogues. And some, in the indiscriminating rage of lust, will go with any woman, whoever she be. Overeating and drinking will disease many and deprive them of strength and sense. Disordered by madness, they will meet death, falling into lakes, pits, or in impenetrable forests, or from hills or housetops. While some will be mute as corpses, others will be forever on the chatter, and yet others will quarrel with their kinsmen and elders. They will be evildoers, cruel, and the destroyers of Dharma. I fear, O Lord, that even that which thou hast ordained for the good of men will turn out for evil through them. O Lord of the world, who will practice yoga and nyasa? Who will sing the hymns, draw the yantra, and make the purashcharana? Under the influences of the Kali age, man will become indeed of wicked nature and bound to all manner of sin. So this is Devi's concern. She sees, although Shiva has given all kinds of instruction for spiritual enhancement, that the people aren't following it. Not only are they not following it, they are turning the rites themselves into a cause of degradation. And this has to do with the intention with which they are approaching these practices. See, if they're taking wine or ganja or whatever, uh, just for the pleasure of their senses, they'll wind up overindulging and losing their intelligence, whatever little intelligence they've got and doing all nonsense. Uh, and the same goes for the Maituna, the tantric sex rituals, which are meant to be performed by man and wife only, and only under certain conditions which are described in detail later on in this work, and also only accompanied by the religious rites and offerings that are appropriate. So what has happened now? Tantra, so-called, as it's practiced in the West, has become just about sex. And the spiritual side, the religious side, that gives good karma, that turns it into a sacrament, has been lost. And this is the fault of the sensationalist authors who introduced Tantra to the West, uh, like Morrison and people like that, who positioned it or portrayed it as only a sexual practice and, and just cut off all the religious part of it. So because of this misrepresentation, the practice has become completely perverted and divorced from its original source. So we are going to try to bring it back and show how Tantra should be performed in the Kali Yuga. Aum Tatsat, Buru Saranai.